still in chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Scotty. Hey. What's up, my man? Glad to be here. Hey, man. Good to see you, man. Thank you. First Thessalonians chapter 3. What was the Apostle Paul's concern last week? It was one word. What was it? What was his concern? He was concerned about the Thessalonians. Come on, y'all. Concerns for the Thessalonians. Hmm. One word, and I didn't write it down. You can, if you just start reading First Thessalonians three, it speaks of it right there. Let's pick up that six. Concerning. Concerning their faith. Do you think the Apostle Paul's concern for the faith? Yeah, I know. It's amazing what you find when you read your Bible. <laughs> the, the, the concern that Paul had for the Thessalonians' faith. Do you believe honestly that God, what's up, big guy? What's up? That God has a concern for the faith of the church of 2019? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. And we should pay attention and we see these red, I think I like eh, eh, eh. these are like alerts. All right. APBs, whatever you call them, all points bulletin. There's something if there's a concern in God's heart to say something through one of his apostles or his prophets, in that day there should be the same concern. All right, and something should go off and sound the alarm within us that there needs to be a concern for the faith. Because I'm telling you, there are men that I am praying for, and I even pray for my own faith. Okay? There are people that have got, that literally, Jesus Christ has placed by name on my heart to pray specifically for an area in their life. And the Holy Spirit says, pray for faith. And I say, yes, Lord. All right? God talked to me just like I'm talking to you right now. And I'm obedient. You've got to have faith. And remember, what did we say last week that the Bible said that faith is? Hebrews 11 and 1. What does that declare? Substance of things hoped for. That faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of what? Things, things not seen. Things not seen. Very good. Hebrews 11 and 6. What does it declare? Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that do what? Diligently seek after him. All right. So faith is absolutely important. Why? Because perilous times are upon us. It's not going to get any better. All right. I told a brother in California, man, happy days are gone. <laughs> he started laughing. I said, I'm for real. Uh, happy days are gone. The only joy you'll find in the earth is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The, our joy should be rooted in the imminent return of the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. That's where our joy is. And if your joy is not in that tonight, man, ask the Lord to help you. Because okay? that's where your joy should lie in, in the center of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, folks. There you go. 
Hey, you gotta bring the Bible again. Man, it's crazy, man. The word is powerful and it's all knowing. All right. Let's pick up in verse. I'll read verses one through five just very quickly. And if anyone will have questions or comments on those first five verses, let me know. But we are going to pick up where we left off last week, which is in verse six, verse one. Therefore, when we could go no longer, uh, when we could we could no longer endure it, I'm sorry, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you encouraging and encourage you concerning your what? Amen. Okay. Read your Bibles. Verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. All right, Paul is saying, don't, don't, don't play dumb. You know why God has sent us here. For in fact, verse 4, we told you before we were with you that we would suffer tribulation. And I like how the Apostle Paul addresses the Thessalonians in tribulation. He does when he addresses it in English, as this, as this scripture is translated, Paul, being a, being a sent one of God, doesn't omit himself from the equation of tribulation. Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. He doesn't omit himself. He includes himself with tribulation. He's saying just because I'm an apostle sent by Jesus Christ from the road to Damascus through all of what I've come to up until this point of writing you somewhere between 53 and 56 AD, tribulation has my name written on it just like it has your name written on it. All right? And to me, that's confidence. Uh, that would, to, would be a confidence or motivating booster for me to know of, of a man of his supernatural status in God is facing the same issues I'm facing. That's why I love Pastor Jordan, even uh, uh, myself and any other uh, preacher, elder, who is, who is not afraid to be bold and, and let you know that we experience issues of life. We've got so many pastors and preachers that want to hide behind the fact with a mirage that they cross every T and dot every I. And I'm here to tell you, pastor, preacher, elder, you are a lie. Okay? You, 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 it's subject to you as well. And to me, I, and I know, it is a motivating thing when our pastor can stand upon God's pulpit and pronounce fallacy, shortcoming, deficiencies, discrepancies, sin, <laughs> but in all confidence can tell you that he's able to go back unto Jesus Christ through the way of what? Repentance. All right, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can lead a man, woman, or child unto what? Repentance. All right, it's powerful. And it should motivate you. And I believe this was a motivating factor to the Thessalonians. Uh, as it happened, if you know, verse 5. For this reason, when I could no longer endure endure it. Again, we, we, it points to Paul's weakness. He had a point where it was very challenging even for him to endure certain things. And what did I point you back to? 2 Corinthians what? The 12th chapter. Beginning somewhere, I believe, around the 7th through, I want to say the 12th verse. But this is when the apostle Paul describes the thorn that's in his flesh. That he goes before Jesus Christ three times, and yet Jesus does not remove it. For the reply of Jesus Christ, and depending on your Bible, should be written in red. Jesus replies to the Apostle Paul in this time of moment of life that <laughs> I'm not going to do it. In other words, that my grace is sufficient for thee. In my weakness, or in your weakness, my strength is made what? Perfect. All right? That was his reply when Paul said, remove it. And I like that because when you go back and study this text, Paul is not praying for something natural. He's not asking to become a king of a nation. He's not asking for a brand new house like most of us do. He's not going before God asking for money. He's not, he's not asking God for a temporal thing, but he's, he's asking God to help him deal with something that's supernatural. All right? Powerful. Very, very, very powerful. We, we may end up visiting, because I think here, here shortly we're going to be transitioning from old back into the new, but we may just be walking with both of them uh, as it deals with uh, what the Apostle Paul was talking about here in 1 and 2 Corinthians. 
But again, he says, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor might be in vain. All right? Questions or comments on the first five verses of the third chapter of 1 Thessalonians? Or comments if you don't have any questions? We good? All right. Verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us what? Okay. Of their what? All right. So remember, transitionally or chronologically, Paul says, in this season of time, I'm not able to endure it. However, the Holy Spirit has prompted me to send my brother, my fellow laborer in the faith. He is a good worker, almost like an understudy of the Apostle Paul. Remember, he grew up in the Eunice. His daddy was a, was a heathen Jew, all right? It was a Greek Jew household. It was split like a lot of our households in America today, all right? Maybe not necessarily Jew-Greek, but either the mama saved and the daddy's a heathen or the daddy saved in the field and the mama's a heathen. Nevertheless, the Bible says that Eunice, his mother and his grandmother, did what? Undergirded the Apostle Timothy in the Word of God. So even from a very young age, in the absence of a daddy, he had someone who had, a, had enough God conscious to present him what? The gospel. That's why when I minister to men, especially in street ministry, and Diamond, and not to throw color into it, but it, it's more a lot of the lives in the African-American community, there's this excuse out there that says, because I didn't have a daddy in my life, I couldn't, I couldn't achieve A through Z. And when I minister them through the word of God, because remember, what did Paul teach us last week? That when we deal with men, all right, whether it be some type of debate, we do it concerning the what? The, the word. The word. I always point men back to Timothy. <laughs> because Timothy's life, he came from a very broken home. And a lot of times when you come from a broken home, regardless of what color you are, it makes you susceptible to demonic attack. I've seen it. Between homosexuality is a real big one, especially in young men's lives in the absence of father, and crime. They, they just, it's just something about, it's, a, it's an ignorant device. And they're poor to it and they're drawn to it. And I always try to point them back to Timothy's life. And even in the absence of a, of a heathen dad, and the Bible really doesn't make it clear to whether he was led to Jesus Christ by salvation or by faith through grace. Nevertheless, we see the evidence of what of how God used Timothy. <laughs> All right? And he can do it to any young man. So again, Timothy is sent out. And listen, he brings back good news. Amen. Yay, right? Of their faith and not just their faith, but their what? Love. Love. Okay? Talk with people and just pay attention. When you hanging out with somebody who you know or feel has an issue of faith in a particular area of their life and watch how they start treating people, it's different. I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. They love different. They're not as chipper down as they, as they would be. All right? But that tribulation or that season of life, it causes them to love different. That's why the Bible says is. Not only was it a good report, Brother James, that their faith was intact, but they were still loving, even though there was a concern with their faith. All right? those, two, those two are synonymous with one another. Right? When you think about the life of Jesus, he's a, he, he is and was, when he walked on the earth, a God who is what? Love. He also represented faith because for him to leave his glorified body to come on this earth, and die for a heathen like me and believe God's plan for the only begotten son to what? All right. You gotta, you gotta watch that. They're synonymous with one another. So when this report comes back, all right, it's just not be, because you can be faithful and still be mm -hmm. mean and a junkyard dog. That's why I don't get caught up in this whole outer adornment. You go back to the, the book of James, he, 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 make, he makes it. And that book, again, when you, when you understand that it's focal, it's focal point is to the Jewish community and to the scattered tribes of the house of Israel, what you'll see is there's a lot of focal, a focus on out of the dorm. And I've seen women with dresses that are hit the floor and they and still full of lust. Okay? Still nasty. Still got a bad attitude. Okay? 
But again, you see here, news of your faith and love and that you always have what? What does your Bible say? Good remembrance. Good remembrance of us, greatly designed to see us as we also to see you. There was a desire in the heart of the Apostle Paul to lay eyes on the people that God has called him to help to minister to and to build their, their reputation in faith. Notice that he says that you remember that you have a good remembrance of us. All right. A lot of people in 2019, Martin, they don't really care about their name or their reputation. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not what the Bible says. In fact, Proverbs 22 and 1, you can turn there if you like. And if you want to try to by the scriptures, but it says, for a man to desire the good name that is better than wealth and loving favor is better than what? Silver and gold. To have a good reputation. To have your name not evil spoken of should mean something in the life of a believer. When I leave the earth, James, I don't want, you know, some people say, well, I really don't care. Well, if it's, if it's from the perspective of not caring because I'm presenting you love in the gospel of Jesus Christ is one thing. But for, for me not caring because I'm living in a way that, that misrepresents Jesus Christ in the kingdom of heaven, that's something we need to be checked about. Two totally different things. Now, if you don't like me and, and, and your definition of not being remembered good is because I was always talking about Jesus Christ, hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> but having your name spoken and remembered in a good light should be part of the legacy outside the gospel and love that you leave everybody that's in your house. I've, I've actually been my, one of my mentors. Said, man, I had to go before God. I, I don't know. I got to preach this brother's funeral. And, they, and he told me straight up, I, I, I'm, I'm going to need Jesus. I'm straight up, Scott. He said, he came to me and said, ooh. And I said, that can happen, Pastor? He said, absolutely. He lived that type of life. <laughs> and Jesus, I, I need your help. I don't know what I'm going to preach in this brother's funeral. That's the name that he left on the earth. But because of the family and the reputation that Pastor Ronald Jones, and shout out to him, <laughs> one of my mentors, one of my handful of mentors uh, that, I, that I confide in on a regular basis, he had a, a good name in the city of Baltimore in the state of Maryland. So he was asked to fly or drive out and, and preach his brother's funeral. And oh yeah, by the way, his nickname was Speedy. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling James, I ain't lying. I call 302 uh, four six five four zero eight two. Call him. He'll tell you a story. <laughs> I laugh every time. But he was he was he was very authentic about it because of the name that this brother left on the earth. Okay, you should desire it. So Paul is saying, "Remember me in a good way. Remembering us, greatly designed to see us as we also to see you." Verse seven. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress. <coughs> We were comforted concerning you by your faith. Okay. Full of distress and affliction. Two words, Lou. As a saved, filled believer, we don't really want to deal with it, but we're going to have to deal with it. Let me tell you something. Being in the Army almost 20 years, I've seen, I've witnessed soldiers that have no problem taking an AR or a pistol anywhere from 25 meters to 300 meters and could very easily put steel on target or steel on paper. Then when you train with them in garrison and then put them in a combat environment where somebody's shooting back at them some, some way, somehow, in, in some cases, their shooting in accuracy isn't the same thing under duress. Come on, y'all. Okay. A lot of us are faithful believers when poop hasn't hit the fan. But I like to hang around brothers when poop is hitting the fan. Because brothers who operate and endure stress and can endure duress under pressure, whoo, 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 whoo. the faith is being tested, my man. I love it. 
You shouldn't be a walk on water believer, a walk on water Christian when everything is going good. I want to see what type of worship you got. I want to see if your prayer life changes. I want to see if your walk changes. I want to see if your talk and your attitude changes when doo-doo hits the fan in your house. Two different types of believers. One that operates without duress and one that operates under duress. Which one are you? Don't answer that. Okay. You shouldn't be any different under affliction and stress and distress. <laughs> That's what Paul's telling the Thessalonians. It's coming your way. And he's speaking twofold. One, or A, because he's already experienced it, past experience, and B, he's speaking to them prophetically of something prophetic that's going to come their way of something they haven't seen yet through a revelation through Jesus Christ. So again, there's there's being a believer and having simple endurance versus endurance while under duress. Two totally different things. Everybody thought in 2012, Vince Young, Vince Young. I don't know how many football geeks I got in here. I'm a, I'm a football geek. Remember 2012, Vince Young was the best thing in, in the University of Texas? Yeah, Vince Young. Um, I know. Oh, he ain't the only one. He's just the one that the Holy Spirit dropped in my, in my mind right now. There's some more out there. We can talk about Reggie Bush. Reggie Bush went through the University of Southern California, ran a 40 Heisman, <laughs> Heisman Trophy winner. And I believe Vince Young was also the Heisman that year in 2012. Or did Tim Tebow get it that year? We need to check that. Yeah. So either Tim Tebow or Vince Young, and he's another byproduct. The only thing that saved him is his faith in Jesus Christ. Vince Young comes out of the league, and let me tell you something. He was a prodigy, six foot seven, a quarterback running a 40 in like four or six seconds. Right? Then he got drafted by who? The Tennessee Titans. And then he found out that those linebackers that sit on the end could run as fast as some of the tailbacks in the National Football League. He couldn't handle it. He dominated college because, well, he was so dominant in college because he wasn't under a lot of pressure. Reggie Bush the same way. New Orleans, Miami. But Reggie Bush found out that those guys in the NFL, they're just as fast as tailbacks. You got linebackers in the National Football League that can run 40s in four, five, four, four seconds. Do the math on that. And these brothers are 250 plus that can bench press close to 350 yes, to some of them 450 pounds repetitiously and can run the 40 yard dash in 4.6 seconds. Reggie Bush wasn't ready for that. He dominated in college because he wasn't under stress or duress. And unfortunately, a lot of men I see in their lives, they operate differently under duress. And it shouldn't be. The same faith that you had that led you to a saving Savior should be the same faith that you possess of that saving Savior that he's able to be your Lord while you're under what? Duress. Reggie Bush was in 2005. 05. Big difference. Man, I'm getting old. <laughs> My God, Kenny. All right, he just yeah, got it's worse, dude. Cam Newton it's worse. Was, was 10. Cam Newton was 10. So Vince Young went out and win. <clears throat> 2012, I'm thinking about Andrew Luck and uh, Cam Newton. Yeah, that was the same draft. And Robert Griffin the third, RG3, right? Mm -hmm. Matt Leiter was a bust. Matt Leiter was a big bust. T was seven. Yeah, that was on seven. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was in um, Baltimore recruiting company then. He's all over that. Yeah. All right. Again, verse 7, therefore, brethren, in our affliction and distress, we comforted, we were comforted concerning uh, you by your faith. Verse 8, I love this. For now we live if, this is the condition, all right, if, if, if. Every time you see the word if in God's word, it represents condition. All right, it's kind of like 2 Chronicles 7, 14. For if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. God says, then will I hear from heaven, forgive them of their sins, and heal the land. 
Okay, conditioned. Paul says here, we can live if you stand fast in the Lord. Men, my cry to you tonight from my heart to your heart, I don't care how saved and holy you think you are, how long you've been walking with Jesus, you've got to remember to stand fast in your what? Faith. Faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be ye watchful, standing fast in your what? Faith. Be ye watchful, standing fast in your faith, quick to live men. Now, when you read that in the King James Version, you're like, that don't make a bit of sense, quick to live you men. But when you translate to English Standard, American Living, and I believe New, uh, New, uh, National, or New Living Translation, and even the NIV Version, the New International what that says translated is act like men. And then the tail end of that verse of 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says that people to do what? Be strong. Read your Bible. Is this there? Try me. Act like men. And I'm telling you what, I, I would believe, God, that I am a man's man. I'm just about as manly as you can get. And I think that, and I, I don't think, help me, Holy Spirit. That's one of the things that I think, I keep saying I think, that I know that really needs to be honed in the perverted age that we're living in now. Mm -hmm. Men be men. And let me tell you something. Saved women want a real man. Okay? I'm telling you. A saved woman who's saved and fit. I ain't talking about impressing her about how fast you can run, how much money you make, and how much you can put up on a bench. She's more concerned about how you can communicate with your God than anything else. Be strong. Be mean is what Paul tells the Corp in his first letter. And I'm telling you what, you got to pay attention, man, and you need to be on your knees. America, I'm telling you, has been persuaded by the spirit of perversion. Yeah. And it is running rapid in the United States of America. If you go on YouTube now, there are men, listen to me, try me, men. There are men on YouTube and, and huge social media platforms, men, with testicles, a, a penis, and testosterone flowing through their body with multi-million subscribers, and the basis of their YouTube channel is makeup and feminine apparel. You've got to be vigilant. If you do YouTube statistics and run the algorithm, and I'm a lot smarter than most people believe, even with my GED because of the Holy Spirit, but if you run the YouTube algorithm, the brothers that are out there, they are more competitive and are yielding a greater audience of men and women to their makeup channel than even your Kim Kardashians and your Paris Hiltons. If we don't need men to be men, be a man. Be strong. Stop being feminine and cowering up when poop hits the fan. It's supposed to. Your father had to endure. You're going to have to endure. Why are men showing women how to put makeup on? It's perversion. It is a spirit. A six foot nine, 200 pound brother Okay, doesn't walk around with his wrist bent and a lisp in his voice except he be under control of a spirit. And I'm tired of the earth and the world saying that we have human and mental disorder. It is a spiritual thing. And we don't have people in the church with enough power and discipline to stay on their face before God to intercede for demonic spirits. Cliff, you look mad. Yeah, I'm pissed. This is where we're at, man. And Paul says, I want you to be strong. Don't cower up and be, je and be jelly back. Let me tell you something. If you're walking with the God that I walk with, this ain't, this ain't a walk for the weak. This ain't a walk for cowards. You can't. You can't be weak and follow Jesus Christ. Be men. Be men. 
And my wife calls me today at work, and that's rare when she, because she, she, for almost 20 years, she never calls me while I'm on duty. Ever. So I, when I saw it, I knew it was something. And very quietly, she told me a thing that had happened because she's out there ministering, and it always turns into ministry when we go visit family. I was like, Lord, give us, can you give us a vacation? God was like, I'm your vacation. Yes, Lord. And here she is calling me. Right? Pray about a thing because this, and the first thing I said, did you talk to you, you, Jesus? You talked to him first? And after she talked to Jesus, who she called? Her husband. Not because I can run fast, which I can't do anymore, and lift a lot of weight, which I really can't do anymore. Right? But because she knows I'm strong in the Lord by my what? My faith. She needs me and wants me to intercede on her behalf in, our, in my absence unto her. Being strong. That's what your trust me. That's what saved women want. To feel confident in a godly man. I need to stop right there because I feel like I'm going in another direction, but be me. Amen? Amen. And if you got sons, teach them to be men. Here to preach again on uh, Well, he's yours, Lord, so yeah, I guess he's a preacher. I'm gonna put my mouth on. I'm talking about it's okay for men to express their feminism, man. It's okay. And I'm like, come on, guy. Come on, man. You, you, you're killing me, big dog. You're killing me. You're killing me. You're killing me. You're killing me. Tell a man to be a man. Just because the pastor, the pastor doesn't make him. It don't matter. He's still God. I ain't gonna, he, he's, a, he's a man after God's heart. So you can't put my mouth on him because he comes from God's heart. Okay. I don't mean I'm endorsed the fact of what he's teaching and preaching, but I'm concerned and it causes me to go into prayer because <laughs> it's contrary to God's word. I ain't going to talk about him. I can go on social media and be a, and, and be a buffoon and gossip and, and get the scripture. No, get on my face. And you're going to see in this letter tonight that that's Paul's primary point is the power of prayer. Supplication and thanksgiving. And men, let me tell you something. We've got to learn to fight that fight from our knees. Trust me. I used to love to bang, Don. I shoot real good and I can throw these real good. Believe me. Love to do it. Love to do it, Scotty. But now God has taught me not to fight that way, to trust him and let him fight the fight. And he's done it every single time. New creature in Christ. Behold, all things have become what? New. Thank you, Jesus. So again, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Be men tonight. And stand fast in the Lord. And teach your children who are young men to do the same thing. Alright? Be men. You'll be, be men. Okay? Trust me. They're going to need to hear it from you. Because between the worldly influence and social media, they're probably going to spend a lot more time in the school, in the public school systems, in the eye of the public school system, and around their friends, right? And the ones that had a, a huge influence. So the little, the small amount of time that you get in front of them, you need to take advantage of it. Because the time that you have doesn't outweigh the time that they have with the influences of the world. And then before you know it, he's a precious little handsome man, you'll be, walk, you'll be seeing him walk across the stage. It'll go that fast. Trust me, Kimmy. I almost out of my house. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? James has got one for sale. Oh, for <laughs> all, 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 I've got two of them. He's not for sale. He's free. <laughs> yeah. You got on, on the corner with the cardboard and the blank one. F R E. Okay. Amen. Amen. All right. So take advantage of it. Verse nine. Or comments or questions on anything before we continue. Good look? Yeah. You gave me the look. No, All good. right. Good to go. Verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God for you? Look at the questions he's asking. Right? All the things that God has called us to do, to come and minister to you, to labor not in vain, right? To pray for you, to minister with you, right? My, 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 look, I'm not asking for an offering. I'm asking for your money. I don't even want your time. I'm asking you again, what more can I do for you? 
Okay. What thanks can be rendered to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? What is this saying? Paul's priority was what? Prayer. Say it again. Prayer. Prayer. Your priority in life, men, should be your prayer life. It was Paul's priority to bring supplication and to make thanks known unto who? Jesus Christ. We're going to learn later in this same book in the fifth chapter and the 18th verse to give thanks in all things because this is what? The will of God concerning you through who? Christ Jesus. You cannot be in God's will outside of having a thankful heart. You got to be thankful. Okay? Thankful. And let me tell you something. If you've been saved for more than a week, you got a lot to be thankful for. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're a type of people oftentimes, Brother Don, that stuff has to be taken away from us before we can learn to give thanks to a supreme God. Believe it or not, I thank God for having a car to get over here tonight. Sure. Because on my way home, I could hit, be hit by somebody who's DWI and I could be a paraplegic or be dead. God, I thank you. Learn to, learn to, get, to be in a position to learn how to give God thanks in everything. God, I'm thankful. My son ain't saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, but you still keep your hand on him. I thank you, Lord. I'm thankful. My gas tank ain't on there, but it got me to Charlotte for the first three days of this week, and I got enough to get me to pay that. God, I thank you. And I'm not ashamed. Why? Because I've learned to give God thanks in everything that I have. Being in his wheel. Most of us need a certain amount or for God to hit a certain checkpoint for we can before we can tell him thank you. <laughs> the devil is a lie. I don't need much Scotty to thank my God. Woo, I'm feeling good. Today was a rough one, but I God, I thank you. Verse 10. Night and day praying how? See it in earnestly. What does that mean? To pray earnestly. To pray, to pray, to pray exceedingly. Constantly. It's consistent. And we know just through basic science and statistics that anything that someone does continuously becomes what? Habit. Habit. Say it again. Habit. Come on. You do something long enough, it will become habitual. That's good or bad. <laughs> Smoking those cigarettes, and it'll start off with a pack, and then you you be a pack of you be down to two pack. I know brothers that smoke two pack a day, and they can still run 12, 13 minute two miles. And I look at them and say, look, you you doing that now because you you twenty one. Well, get get to about 37, 30 if the Lord even lets you see that far, and I promise you, you won't be doing what you're doing now. If you're not already fighting cancer, emphysema, and everything else under the sun. That's like Pastor Dog had talked about. Everything that we do comes with a consequence. So prayer life. Praying. You want the foundation of prayer? Go to Matthew 6. It's there. 10 through 13, or 9 through 13. Yeah, you want to see how Jesus prayed? Go to John chapter 17, the entire chapter. He prays for himself, he prays for the disciples, and then he prays for those who are saved. The Lord's Prayer, John 17. I call it TLP, the Lord's Prayer. Okay? And you study that, I'm telling you, we're going to, we'll go into that next week. Or, yeah, next week. We ain't going to do anything tomorrow. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to start off with, with the Lord's Prayer of John 17. We're going to pick, and I want you to, that's your homework lesson for the night. So write that down, your faith, and your iPad, whatever you got. And I want you to look at the 17th chapter of St. John very intimately. And we're going to see certain things, and there's certain things, hopefully the Spirit of God will show you that you can pull out 
and then you can implement and use these things in your prayer life. And what you'll find out is, is that when you learn how to pray God's word, oh my, that possesses a lot of power. Okay. Praying using the word of God is powerful. And it's a very powerful deliverance tool. Praying God's word. Amen? Amen. So again, Paul made prayer a priority. And he did not forget to thank God for what he was doing. And I'm telling you, if believers and Christians in today need to follow an example, it is the Apostle Paul because he's praying with praise. He's praying with thanksgiving, supplications, and petitions that are all being made known unto the Lord. Okay? It is an absolute necessity that men, men, have direct fellowship and communion with the God of the universe. He desires it. He wants it. He earnestly looks for it. And I'm telling you, the scripture does not lie. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. And the way you seek after an invisible God is on your face, with your mouth, in your heart. Prayer. Prayer. That's what the author of Hebrews is pointing to in that chapter. Prayer. Man, how do I get in contact with an invisible God? Your prayer language, your prayer life that has now become habit in your life. Amen? Amen. Verse 10, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect. Not perfect, and perfect. What is lacking in what? Okay. That's, a, that's something that made me, I mean, me, that, that was an underlying circle highlight. Because I'm asking God, what is that thing or the things that can cause my faith? Because Paul's asking the question. So you should ask the question where in my faith, in my Christian walk, does my faith lack? What's lacking? And don't sit here tonight and pretend like you don't have lack. Because if you did not have lack, there'd be no need for Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's shut that down now. The devil of pride get out of here if you ever tried to show up. Goodbye. Ding ding. I rang the bell for you. Good night. So now I think you need to pose yourself the question back unto Jesus Christ. Lord, show me where I lack. Because trust me, one of the focal points for demonic attack is through the move of doubt. Turn to, turn to uh, St. Mark 11, quickly. You already there? Go to 23rd verse. Begin to read. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be, be removed and be cast into the sea, and, doubt. and does not doubt in his heart. Okay. And does not doubt in his heart. And what Jesus is using is, is almost, uh, I don't know the, the, the past tense or the present tense of the word. So we just won't use that word because I don't know what I'm talking about right there. I do, but I can't come up with the word. But it's almost hyperbolic or hyperbole in the sense that God is, is really what he's saying. In order for us to move this mountain, okay, whatever that is in your life, and that may be different for each man in here tonight, and more than likely, we could share the same mountain. All right, We could share the same mountain. Is that possible? Absolutely. But Jesus is saying through St. Mark, he's like, look, in order for you to move this mountain, first of all, you cannot be possessed with what? No. Doubt. For if a man say unto this mountain, Be ye removed and cast into the sea, he cannot doubt in his heart. That's why there's got to be such an emphasis in your life in the area of faith. 
Where you doubt, you leave the door open for demonic attack. Believe me. Men begin to move away from God. They break fellowship. God, where are you at? God, I don't see you. I'm talking to you. You won't respond. Yada, yada, yada. Then more than likely, there's some doubt in the room. Continue. But believes those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Continue. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. Thank you, sir. And that was 24, correct? Yes. Okay, so make that, make that part of your scripture. Mark 11, 23 and 24 is powerful. And mountain's a big thing. But I seen Brother Scotty men struggle with stones. <laughs> Stroke gravel. Like this, right? Now listen. Ah. Can't, can't kick the stone. You ain't gonna deal with that mountain. No. Right. Faith. There's a concern here. There should be concern. And I own it. Go unto God secretly. Show me where I lack. Because I'm telling you, lack is opportunity for the adversary. I know from experience, lack and insufficiency is opportunity for Satan. Okay? Comments or questions? Good? Again, what is lacking in your faith? To perfect. That word perfect is to complete. At the end of the day, the word or the word that I want you to remember for this particular scripture is there is always room for what? Say it again. There's always room for improvement. No one in here has arrived. Because I'm still looking at you. You're, you're still in the body. <laughs> and there is no crown over your head. As of yet. Amen? Amen. There was always need for improvement. I don't care how much you read, how much you pray, and I read and pray with the best of them. And I can tell you, James, without a shadow of a doubt, I am nowhere close to crossing every T and dotting every I. I'm striving for the narrow gate, which is the kingdom of God by faith and grace. Every single day that God breathed breath in my body. And it's a narrow gate, Jesus said, that very few find. 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you see there? Paul does what? He does or does not what? Trinity. Say it again. Trinity. There's no omitting. Okay. Father, God our Lord, Jesus Christ the Son, Right? That he does what? Direct our way to you. And verse 12, may the Lord make you increase and abound in what? Love. To who? Who is Paul's his words? Who who is he replicating? Whose words is he replicating in the scripture? Jesus. Where at? You wanted some hard, where at? <laughs> huh? John, John where? No? Nope. Yeah? What verse? 31. 35. Go to it. Come on, John 13, 35. Turn it in. John, John opened his mouth. We can make it hard. Do this all night. And I'm excited too, Don. My wife coming home tomorrow night. Thank you, Jesus. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Say what? By this, everyone will know that What's you this? are my disciples. If you love one another. We, Jesus says, folks in the world will know that you are my children. Not because of what you drive, not because of how much you tithe, not because how much you volunteer, not because how much you preach and teach, but how you dedicate an abounding love one to another. Notice that the Apostle Paul's focal point is not on how the disciple or the saved one or the saint shows love to the world, but how the saint shows love to one another. 
Because as sadly as it is, I've seen Christians, especially in missions work and evangelism, that love street people, loves a stranger, but can't talk with their fellow believer. Baffles me, JB. <laughs> I don't, I don't like, come on. What is this we doing? <laughs> How we show love abounding. Why? Because what is so special about that love, that abounding love that Paul is praying that would increase in the heart of the Thessalonians? Why do you believe there's such a, a great emphasis there? Because it keeps you focused. It keeps you focused. What else? What else? Compassionate. Keeps you compassionate. What else? Keeps you strong in your faith and God, gives you that endurance. Makes you closer to God. I mean, it does keep you closer to God. Mm -hmm. It brings it, it gives you the opportunity, man. Jesus. It meant, it did. It's that, but, but now you got Kenny who's abounding in love. What if I'm in that point of duress? And affliction. Right. Now, if he showers me in love that covers a multitude of sin and it can increase my faith, if Kenny loves on me the way Jesus describes in the 13th chapter of St. John, then there's a strong possibility not only will my faith increase, but that he can reconcile me back to the God that he that he so loves so much. Mm -hmm. And that's how we lose a lot of church folks. We would rather talk about them and put our mouth on them than to receive them in reconciliation through what? Love. I'm not so much concerned about how much money you can give me. I'm concerned about how much you can love me. Because even if you give me and I'm thankful for it, the temporal is just that, temporary. But it's the love of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, that can, that can do what? Cover, be the blanket of all sin. Even the sin that I omit and the things that I failed to do, the book of James said, for a man to know to do right and for him not to do it to him, it is sin. So there may be an area where I'm struggling and I'm faithless in that I'm just omitting in my life either out of deliberate disobedience or failure to yield to the voice of God. But if Kenny can just show the, the love of Jesus Christ, man, it, it, it might do wonders. Yes, sir. The word love, there's, there's and we've talked about this in the past, there's in Greek language, there's three words, well, there's flexion four, mm -hmm. there's three words that primarily are used for love. And the key word used <coughs> most of the time in the New Testament about love is agape. The other love, if, 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 if you go back to um, to um, 1 Peter one twenty two, and look at that, I mean, it says that since you have been in obedience and truth and, pur and mm -hmm. purify your souls for your sincere love of your brethren, okay, so that love right there is filial. Mm -hmm. It's a brotherly love. Mm -hmm. But be but also fervently love one another. And that love there is a copy. So you have to so I think sometimes we we sometimes miss what that word really means. You know John first John or John so in first John writes that we can't love agape because it's not in us. It has to come through God. God loved us first. You go back to John 3, 16. For God so loved agape, the world. So what, what, is, what does agape mean? And, and, and it's kind of neat because if you really sit down and you look at the word, it's, it's an unselfish love. It's not only is it is an unselfish love, it's a pursuing love. Okay? It's a love that pursues, and, and in like in 1 Peter, again, it's a, and it's a Cliff mentioned it covers all sins. So when we're when we're sitting here and we're, and we're looking at this verse, he says, "For love one another." But then the next, and, but you're going to see after that comment, and <coughs> all people, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the, th the thing I think sometimes we miss in this is that it's not just a feel-good situation. Agape love is not a 
all a warm puppy dog type love. You know? Agape love is loving somebody that you really don't want to love. Mm -hmm. You know? Agape love is, is, is reaching out and seeing people the way God sees them. Mm -hmm. Again, go back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world. He didn't say, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll select few. Mm -hmm. He didn't say just the ones that, can, that he knew was going to go to church and love his son. Uh -huh. He said, for God so loved the whole world. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, and, and sometimes I think we miss that word. We, we, you know, and, and unfortunately, in, in the English language, you know, we can love hot dogs. We can love going to the beach. We can love my wife. You know, I mean, I can love my dog, which, you know, I, don't, I can't say that too much because I, I like my dog, but I don't love my dog. <laughs> he loves his dog probably better than my dog. <laughs> but, you know, it, the thing is, is that word is so commonly used. You know, love is sex yeah. in, in our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, so the word love it just sometimes doesn't ring a bell to us. But if you, if you you when you read the scriptures... And you and you read. I mean, go back to First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and it goes through. You know, what is love all about? And what is the, if I do? You know, if I prophesy, if I give my body, whatever, and I have not love, I have not. I got they love. It's worthless. Yeah, nothing. You know. So I think something when when we sit here and, and our challenges when we when we sit there and we read the word love, especially love one another, because it's almost like the eleventh commandment. You know. That we are to love one another. You know, the greatest commandment is, is to do what? Love your brother. Love the Lord your God first. Right. right. Love the Lord your God first. God they love. You know, and, and again, what does God be love? God be love is unselfish love, a love that pursues. Okay? And so when you when you have a God they love, you're pursuing first after God. You know, so it says, you know, you shall. Pursue after God. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And then you are to pursue loving one another. You know? And when we and when we begin to, to see love in that perspective, then it changes the whole meaning. The way we can kind of think and Americanize in, in the English version of love, it just changes all again. I mean, in King James, when, when in, in 1 Corinthians, it, talk, it, it says charity, which I understand why the, the King James used charity, because charity is an act of giving or an, is an act of doing something. And that's what agape love is. Agape love is the act of doing something. You know, and that's what God did. He did it out of Him, an unselfish love. And so when we see the word to love one another, to agape one another, or in the Greek version is agape or agape, um, agape el, which is they, you know, because of the changing of the of the, of the context as a verb and stuff like that, it's a pursuing love to others. And it's, you know, I, it's a neat thing just going and, and, to, and just look up in the New Testament all the words about love. Amen. Anybody else? Good. Amen. Back to 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love one to another and to who? All people. Okay. So there's an order there. Okay. Love the saints. Or the saved. And that word saints, that's what that's translated to. Save people. And save people. Right. Love them. Love them. And I will tell you, it is very, it's, let me tell you something. On two ends of the spectrum. It is easy to love people that reciprocate the same love. All it's day. easy to love people that love you. All day. That's easy. The challenge is, and I'm telling you, there are people, we're, there are some in the room tonight that are having a hard time loving people. You, in fact, you despise them and it becomes easy in your flesh to despise them more than it is to love them. And it's easy. It's easy to love people who love you back. The challenge, Brother Scotty, is to love people that you know can't stand your guts. Or vice versa, you can't stand them. <coughs> oh, yes, sir, it is. But often you these possible. actions are the wrong Christ. that the normal man would want to put a cash sure. in. And to go in there and forgive on him. Sure. Show him love. Sure. Well, that's the hard one. It's powerful, though. That's why Paul is praying for an abounding increase in that particular area specifically in their life. Because when this, when God raises this church up, 
in the latter parts of this missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, and you'll see in the second letter, they're going to face some trying times where they're faced with other regions and other principalities that they're going to have to love their way through through the power of Jesus Christ. Okay? It's only going to be through God's love. Verse 13, so that he, the capital H, talking about God, may establish your hearts blameless. This is very powerful. They may establish your hearts blameless in what? Holiness. Holiness before our God and Father at the coming of who? With all his what? Save folk. And that's where our hope is. Lord, present my heart blameless unto God. Holiness. Holiness. Paul talks about this in Romans, the 12th chapter, does he not? The very first verse, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the what? Mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That is in the Bible, right? Okay, uh-uh. y'all looking at me crazy. Like, I just made that up. All right, verse 2. I like this here. Matthew 6. 14. Yeah, I know where you're at. Read it. This is the message version. Come okay, on, read it. In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. Yep. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. That's right. Um, that's that love package, man. It's inclusive. Yeah, if you, if you refuse to do your part, <laughs> you cut yourself off from God's part. Amen. 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 I like that. I mean, Judd Dunn is but still, I mean, it's a package deal, man. Right. It's, it's six nights and seven days, yeah, man. It'll be judged. All the all the meals are included, man. It's an include it's an inclusive package. All right. So holiness, 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 holiness. And remember, we talked about that last Wednesday, the Wednesday before, being sanctified. That level of sanctification, that progressive sanctification. And what do we say? And part of that is, it's God doing what? Transforming us. And a lot of times we don't appreciate the process of transforming because it is a very slow transformation. Painful. It's slow. I'm like, dang, Marty, when is Marty going to get it? Dang. All right, but thank God. That's just pretty he gets it before he, his breath leaves his body. Right. And I'm just using you as an example. Because I think I can talk about you like that without you, you know. <sighs> Got it. I just pray that he get it. And it's slow. Mm -hmm. We don't like it. And then we like to judge the salvation of others, and I would challenge you in that area, not to judge other people's salvation. All right? Because you came to God almost when you wanted to come to come to come to the Lord. And the Lord, through his characteristic of long suffering, still granted you what? Grace. I'm just saying. And we start to say, man, well, James just ain't getting it. James need to give it his fast. Brother, shut up. You ain't getting it as fast either. Mm -hmm. Stop. Love on them. Love on them. It's a slow transformation. It's progressive. And then our prayer is that when we see Jesus Christ and he did, and he raptured, and when we get in the fifth chapter, we're going to break this whole rapture thing down from A to Z. You know, that when he comes and he gathers the church as Peter preaches in, in uh, 1 Peter 3 18 and when he comes back that we can be found without spot or wrinkle without blemish before our God that is ultimate sanctification that in a twinkling of an eye our corruptible will put on incorruptible and our mortality will now put on immortality somebody ought to say amen <laughs> that's real good alright so again, 13, that your hearts be blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming. At the coming. So what is Jesus going to do, J.B.? He coming. Oh, God. All right. And it's like a, a, a woman who gives birth. You've experienced, any, any men experience your women, your, your, your women give birth? Mm -hmm. Can anything stop it? Jesus coming. And there's nothing that's going to stop his return. And it behooves of us to have a bell go off in us to remember to live in such a way that that return can happen at an instant's moment. 
and to encourage your loved ones, even in your immediate family, down to your neighbor and the contacts in your cell phone to remind them of such a thing. I witnessed to my neighbor a couple days ago. Are you kidding me, man? We get brother. He's coming. <laughs> I ain't, I'm, I'm telling the truth, Lou. That was the reply. And the hair stood up on my back. I ain't lying. I ain't got much hair at all. But I could feel a presence. And I told him what God told me to tell him. He's coming. And he's calling you and your family. Choose this day. Today is the day of salvation. And his wife came a couple times, I think, to women. And he's even. He's even. Steve, I love that brother, but he's a heathen. He needs Jesus. Just like I was the same heathen. Amen. That's why I can relate to it. He ain't living no different than I was. Matter of fact, I was living worse than Steve. Steve, he like a, what you call it, man? He a good sinner. Is that such things, uh, uh, Scotty? Probably not. Yeah. He, he, I don't know, he just, I don't know really how to describe it. Really. It's good sinners when they don't, if they don't they classify their sins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah man, he's, there's measurements. Yeah, there's yeah, measurements. Yeah, right. 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 But he needs Jesus. He needs Jesus. Wash my hands. Be all right. Yeah. And I don't treat him any different. And they know who, they know what I do. They know who I represent. They know who I am. I am. Even Chrissy on the other side. I didn't even know Chrissy from Adam. She was cutting her grass one day. And she said, ain't you the this, this, that, that, that? And I was like, yeah, how do you know that? My daughter said this about you. Your name, Proverbs 22 and 1. Oh, really? First thing she said, well, and I, I ain't said a word, Scotty. She said, oh, yeah, I drink a little bit, I cuss. And I'm like, she just curved me through a laundry list of things that she's doing. And I'm like, girlfriend, take that before the Lord. Why are you telling me? Because <laughs> the automatic assumption is, is I'm going to treat her different right. because of who I represent. But I'm the same. I acknowledge her and greet her every time I see her. I cut her grass if she needed. When she, when she, uh, uh, or the, or the, my Greek friend across the way that owns that nice restaurant on Olds on on Business 16, all of them. And I tell all of them, I love all y'all, but y'all need Jesus. And, and it's in love. I don't treat them any different. I don't act different and say, I just came from Bible study, y'all. How y'all doing this evening when I come home? <laughs> Got a big chain like Flavor Flavor to say Jesus and all go. I live a lifestyle. And when you live a lifestyle, people, let me tell you something, people's flesh yearn after that lifestyle because it was my flesh that when my wife got saved, yearn after that lifestyle that sent me to the church. Because I wanted to figure out who she came in contact with that's got her loving on me even when I'm deliberately doing things that, that are wrong that make her mad. Same thing for me, brother. And Jesus let that fire in 2009 and went out since. Why? Because I was introduced to who? Jesus Christ. I'm going somewhere, y'all. All right. Y'all looking at the watches and stuff. I'm getting y'all nervous. All right, I'm going to go. I'll go Tuesday. We're ready to go. I got you. Yeah, we're up. Amen. I'm hungry, too. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let's, let's begin in verse 4. And we pray. Uh, yeah, we did it because it's 15 after. Listen to this. Listen to what the Apostle Paul is saying before he gets into the rapture and the revelation that Jesus Christ gives him on his second coming, which is chapter 5. Tell in a four going into 5. Finally, did, excuse me, brethren, we urge. And Paul uses words like urge and exhort. beseech. Yeah, he uses exhort, but that urge and words like beseech is almost like a begging. I'm trying to, I, there, there's something that's important that I'm kind of, I ain't making you do it. But I'm, I'm given a concession to do it. And the Apostle Paul and a lot of the apostles give concessions. When you study the Word of God, you'll see that there are a lot of concessions made. And a concession is nothing more than an exhort, exhortive command without commanding a man to do a thing. But it's, it's with strong encouragement that I present you a, con a concession, Scotty, that you give God your money. Okay, I can't make Scotty do anything. Like preachers and pastors, we look, we can't we can't make you get saved. We can preach until we, we call a brother's shirt in the back, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have to make a choice to serve the Lord. Alright, it's a concession. So Paul says through concession, I urge and exhort. And that word exhort means to do what? Come on, y'all. To encourage. To lift up. 
to motivate, okay? In the Lord Jesus, and see how he combines the two words. Jesus saves, all right? The Lord lords, <laughs> and he needs to be both in your life, all right? And I'm going to preach that one day again when, when the opportunity presents itself because that's where a lot of people are missing the boat. Jesus is only their Savior and has never, you have never allowed them to become Lord. And the Lord has laid out in my heart almost six, seven, eight months ago. And it, it's coming. Uh, thank you, Jesus. That you should abound more and more. More and more. Not just abound, but abound more and more. There's an excessiveness to the language of the Apostle Paul. What is he talking about? Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. And one of the biggest disconnects in the struggle in the life of saved men is walking consistently. I put emphasis on that word consistently. Walking in a consistent way that pleases God. I don't care who you are. I am telling you through God's word and through experience I don't care how old you are, how young you are, or in between in that midlife crisis, one of the most difficult things for men to do who are saved is to walk in a way that pleases God. It's walking. But are you walking in a manner that God can in, in a manner that God can sit from the throne of high and say, I am pleased with Marty Vance's walk? Because that should be the desire. That God could sit on the throne with the earth under his feet and know that every man in this body shop tonight is walking in a way that pleases him. And here's the catch. It's not that we don't know how to walk when we're surrounded by the saints, but it's walking upright when you're not surrounded by the saints. I can fool James all day. James think, man, that old Bible quoting, holy brother, man, I love Clifford, and I'm going home, man, and you have no idea that I'm a second, I'm the second, third coming of the Antichrist. Because you have a lot of brothers that live that way. And I've counseled men that live that way. And I tell them to their face, that ain't how you treat your wife. Your wife is threatening to leave you and she's upset with you because you talk to her like she's crap. And brothers want to sw swell up. Swell up in Jesus. Because that's swelling up. You put fear, you don't put fear in me. This is what you ask for. We here. My wife and I, we here to we here to God give you godly counsel and love. And it happened. You want to swell up. I wish you would. Because you ain't doing right. You're expecting God to move on your behalf. It is difficult, even when saved and filled with gifts and callings and the talents of Jesus Christ, and to walk in a worthy manner that pleases God. You need Jesus Christ. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's turn to Galatians 5. And I hope y'all remember this. Probably not. I don't remember this. Y'all remember this. Now, can you tell me concerning faith when I came in tonight? So I'm done. Galatians 5. Let's start at verse 15. And we definitely will have to stop here tonight. Galatians 5. Start at verse. Uh, da, 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 let's go fifteen. Somebody read fifteen. Galatians five and fifteen. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. <laughs> okay. Remember when Paul was speaking to the Galatians? Uh, they were gnawing on each other. They weren't being kind, like Lincoln. They were being the pit bulls. All right. They want to tear each other up. Instead of building one another up, they were competing instead of completing, right? They were gnawing on each other. And Paul lets them know that same hatred and devouring, it'll consume you. And it'll be overtaken. The love that should be what should be going back and forth, the devouring will, will cause you to, to be eaten by one another. And it's an exclamation point in my Bible. So Paul is putting a great emphasis on this fact. We're talking about love a little bit tonight. Verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does that mean? 
What is Paul saying? Jesus said you won't obey in the flesh. Okay. How about this? What is the only consistent way to overcome sin? Walk in the spirit. Bingo. Okay. The only way to overcome sin is to walk with an overshowering power step by step. Brother Lou, you hit the nail. You struck it. Well, I'm going to drive it. I'm going to make sure it's under the wood. Because this power of the Holy Spirit that a lot of church folks becomes churchy. I walk in the Spirit. You don't know what walking the Spirit means. Yeah. Stop. I hear y'all. Stop. Show me the Scriptures. Give me an example of your life of how you walk in the Spirit. Okay? It's become churchy, like the word love. And we beat it down and we've abused it. But it is a step by step of an overpowering leadership of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's important that we understand that Jesus must become your Lord. Because the Lordship of God leads you as you hold His hand step by step. My granddaughter in Japan was one about to turn two, I think, and wanted to cross the street by herself. I snatched her little butt up so fast, she looked at me like I had taken the breath out of her body. Why? Because I had to show her and understand, baby girl, and, and there was cars coming. And I had turned my back just for a second, right? And before I knew it, I heard her little in the grass, and I turned around, Jake, it was like instinct. Shoot, she looked at me, and, and I kind of caught myself like, you know, I, I, I got her. But I had to remind her, I'm the one that leads you across. You ain't big enough to get across this street. If a car comes around this corner speeding in this neighborhood, which most military installations, if you've ever lived on them before, my God, you think you're in the Indy 500. They have no respect for children in, in plain. None. And I have to let her know, baby girl, I'm Papa, you're the granddaddy. And she understands, she understood. You don't hold, I don't hold your hand so you can take me across the street. I hold your hand so I can show you how to get across the street. Why? I have the knowledge, I've got the power, I've got the strength, the speed, the ability, the know-how, and the foreknowledge to see what can happen now. And if something doesn't happen, I can, or tries to happen, I can protect you. That's God unto us. A lot of us try to do this so-called, oh, I'm walking in the spirit, right? Man, you ain't, because you're leading your own life. That's right. You lead yourself through self-ambitious pride and call it, call it walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit is having a total amount of submit, uh, a severity of submission that commits your ways unto the Lord. It's you holding God's hand and God saying, you cross the street when I tell you to cross the street. And you stay still until I tell you to move. And if men's lives look like that walking, to, walking according to the Spirit, step by step, the results of the decisions that we make, oh my God, Brother Lou, they look different. The outcome will be absolutely different. Amen? Amen. Amen. I have to show my G, baby. Ah, you go. You go when I tell you to go. You stop when I say stop. You won here. <laughs> you won. God, I'm, I'm telling you, God, I believe God, God showed me that. We the same way. Try to move on our core. Try to wheel ourselves into, into God's mind thinking we, we know what's best. Stop. You didn't know what was best before you got saved. You sure don't know now that you are saved. You still need him. You need him step. And that's what Paul is saying in, in, in Galatians. It is to live step by step in the power of the Holy Spirit as he works through our spirit. Nothing else and no one else. Amen? Amen. Continue, Scotty. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Thank you. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, mm -hmm. you are not under the law. Okay. Paul says, we ain't, we ain't talking about the war in Iraq. We ain't talking about the war in Afghanistan. We ain't talking about the war in uh, uh, methamphetamine. We are talking about the war that nobody's talking about on YouTube, social media, or in the church. And that's the war that's going on in your members. Every war in national media is getting addressed. But I'm waiting for the day, Brother Marty Vance, when God's going to open up the mouth of somebody in position who can speak on CNN, Fox News, and all these major networks that's going to declare the war on flesh. They'll get fired, they'll lose their job, but God will be glorified. That's my I man. You can you better not, I'm telling you right now, God better not ever open the door for you to get a spotlight on anywhere. That's a wrap. Let me get on Ellen DeGeneres or Oprah. Let all these other clowns get up there. It's not, bro, man. It's a wrap. You can't you can't love without Jesus. Man. You um, can't do anything without Jesus. Yes. Nothing. And that's what the world needs to know. They're only going to get that message through people who are bold, who ain't jelly back, who are men who want to be and, and, and be strong in the Lord. That some, I'm telling you, because they need to they need to hear this. How else are they gonna get it if they don't get it from the church? Those that are supposed to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. How? That was rhetorical, but right. There's a war going on that we need to talk about because there's a lot of fleshly men whose flesh are being energized by Satan. Mm -hmm. And there's only one or the other side that you're going to come out of, and I'm telling you, there's only one side that's victorious. Are y'all hearing me? Oh, Flesh energized by Satan. And I'm going to leave you with this. And the life of a believer should never be underestimated. Did you hear what I just said? Flesh. Body. Okay. You and I. Shaped. And filled. And it's energized by Satan, the adversary, the opposition. You should never, it should never be underestimated. Ever. Never underestimate. Never. For time's sake, I'm going to pick it up from here, Scotty. The 18, if you're led by the by the a spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, and we know these works, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts, wrath, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, things that I know men in here tonight have never faced with and never struggling or not even struggling with right now. So you can just put a black marker through that. You know, right? Like most of Catholicism does, Paul's letters, just, just rip it out of the Bible. You don't need it. Uh, don't really do that, okay? Uh, envy, murderers, drunkards, reveries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not do what? You can't inherit it. Okay. Just not. Then we get into the fruit of the Spirit. All right. Long suffering, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self control. Huge area where men struggle in. Mm -hmm. Get another 30 minutes in here tonight. Uh, against. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> against such as there, there, uh, there is no law. 24 and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get into the Lord's Prayer a little bit next week, but we're going to come right back to Galatians because I'm just kind of highlighting. I want you to look at this tonight as well or throughout the week until we meet again. And those who are Christ, uh, those who are Christ, there's ownership here. Ownership. There's onus. Okay? When you are Christ, you are owned by Christ. You do know your Bible says that you were bought with a price. Sure. You were bought with a price. Okay? You've been purchased. You're not perfect. But you've been purchased. Mm -hmm. That could preach too. I'm going to write that down. Uh, flesh, not that. Flesh with his passion and desire. Verse 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in that same spirit. Verse 26. Let us not become what? Boastful. Conceited. Also boastful. Provoking one another and doing what? In being one another. We're done. Flesh, 